right, hello everybody. Uh, welcome, hope you enjoyed the, the keynotes today. Uh, my name is John Bellamerick and uh, from Google and here my uh, co-speaker, Yang Tang from Avanti. Um, thanks for joining us today, talk about Core DNS a little bit. Um, so uh, the first uh, bit of this, we'll talk just kind of an update on the Core DNS project and a little bit of an overview. And then we, Yang will drill in a little bit on uh, what it takes to develop a Core DNS plugin, which is actually really, really easy. Um, and then we'll, we'll have time for some Q&A probably. So most of you use Kubernetes, I assume, uh, which means you're probably using Core DNS, whether you know it or not. Uh, most Kubernetes clusters out there uh, use Core DNS as their in-cluster DNS for service resolution. But um, in fact, Core DNS is an independent project with a, uh, uses outside of Kubernetes. And it kind of grew up uh, alongside Kubernetes for the most part uh, and was built to provide an alternative to the traditional DNS server. So if you look at something like Bind, uh, it's, you know, it's a very venerable code base, uh, quite difficult to extend, um, quite difficult to kind of manage in a cloud native way. And so uh, Core DNS was built to start to, um, it, it, to, to provide a DNS server that one was written in a sort of a modern language that was memory safe, so it's written in Go, uh, but also because a lot of bind vulnerabilities uh, came out of just being in C. Um, and to be able to be uh, evolved quickly and to be able to add functionality quickly, to be able to kind of adapt to the rapidly changing cloud native environment that we saw happening uh, a few years back uh, as in the growth of containerized services. So Cordiana started with a focus on service discovery, um, but kind of the most important part in my mind to it is this, what we call a plugin based architecture. Um, and it's a, different than most DNS servers, it's a sort of request handling process. So the individual DNS requests come in and we feed them through a series of pi uh, a sort of pipeline of, of plugins and those plugins can make decisions and we can compose the plugins and the, the configuration of those plugins to really do some interesting things uh, with the DNS requests. Uh, we do have quite a few contributors. Uh, nearly 400 now, and you know, a lot of growth in the project. Uh, part of CNCF process is this idea of a public contributors file. So we don't, mo there's many, many more, or a public adopters file rather. So we've got 35 people, 35 companies who've said they're, they're using Core DNS in some way or another, but really it's, it's in the thousands uh, or more because uh, like I said, anybody using EKS or AKS, um, or I'm, I'm from Google, but actually GKE, not. Uh, not the core GKE, we don't use core DNS, but we do for our, um, our on-prem and bare metal uh, offerings, we, we use core DNS. So um, really the vast majority of people using Kubernetes out there uh, are using uh, core DNS in some way or another. We did um, in the last year or two shift from a uh, benevolent dictator for life governance model to a steering committee. Um, so now we have, a, a, I think, five people on the steering committee. Both of, both of us are on the steering committee. But uh, it's a pretty low drama project, so not much happens in the steering committee. But uh, uh, if anybody's interested in, you know, jumping in and participating in, in Core DNS, we'd love to have you. Very um, friendly, welcoming place, uh, and, and um, we, we'd love to, love to see you there. Since the last uh, KubeCut EU, um, this is some of the new functionality that's been added. So uh, a new plugin for dealing with the configuration of listener timeouts, which we're just using the defaults before, um, and a bunch of new features on individual plugins. We had a release, our most recent uh, release was in uh, August, but we should be having, I think, a new release in particular with a new, using built with a newer version of Go coming out pretty soon. Um, like I said, 
QuartyNS is really originally targeted around service discovery, and what we'll show you in a moment is just an example use case of how you can use QuartyNS outside of Kubernetes as a uh, you know, DNS server that can be backed by multiple different data sources rather than you know, a typical DNS server, which is backed, say, say by Bind, or um, maybe just serves data for your Kubernetes cluster. You can actually take QuartyNS out separately and configure it to do, uh, to do additional things. Um, so what uh, the, the example core file, so I guess I didn't give that much background. So CoreDNS is, you know, as a process is configured by something we call a core file, not a core dump, it's a different thing. And it's just a very simple file uh, that allows you to specify for any given zone what are the plugins that are active for that zone and what are the plugins that are then, um, uh, what, what data sources are used for that, for those, to, to serve up the data for that zone. And it's, it, one of the interesting things I think in, in Core DNS is that a single zone can actually be divided among different data sources. So you can sort of create a hierarchy of, of your records that are served for your different zones, uh, where you'd say, I'm going to allow the, I'm going to allow you to override, say, directly in the core file, a few A records for, for this zone. But if you don't find it in that list, for, for like a host file type of list, you can consult your Kubernetes cluster. If you don't find it there, you can consult a file or something like that. So there's a sort of, uh, uh, allows you to construct a single DNS zone from a composition of different data sources. And in this example that we have here, what we've done is uh, allowed you to compose a zone from th that's backed by your three different uh, clouds. So, or I guess we have two here, AWS and Google Cloud DNS. So essentially this allows a single zone to be served up in part by AWS, uh, backed by the AWS API and in part backed up by the Google Cloud API of services that are out there and in part backed up by a local, local data source, this Who Am I plugin. And honestly, that's all there is to it. It's not much to say. Uh, this, is what, this is an example core file. We can digest this a little bit. It starts with dot, fi, dot colon 53. So the dot just means root zone, right? Any, any query coming in for any zone will be processed by this block of, uh, of plugins. Um, the first one processed is Route 53. So what's happening here? The, the, if we go back to this, this diagram, QuartyNS as a process is sitting there. You're configured with the Route 53 plugin. So what you do is uh, you actually take your AWS credentials and you connect to the AWS API and you load the data from there and you use that to uh, synthesize the records for the zone. Similarly, for uh, Cloud DNS, this uh, connects back to Google Cloud, brings in the, the, or synthesizes the record based on the API data available in Google Cloud. And the fall through statement on here basically says that we can, um, if we don't find an answer in this in that data source, fall through to the next data source. So that's why it goes from Route 53 to Cloud DNS, which then eventually falls through to this just sort of plugin that returns an answer for everything. Um, so that's really all you need to configure this. It's a really very simple, simple process. Um, the the functionality, and I don't know if we have a slide here, Young, on the um, no the the. The functionality available, there's many plugins available, and we tend to divide it into three different uh, categories. So there's plugins that allow you to configure CoreDNS, like the bind plugin, which allows you to tell you which uh, interface to bind to. There's plugins that provide different data sources. So like I said, the different cloud uh, vendors, um, a file or a Kubernetes cluster, or even multiple Kubernetes clusters can be can be used to back data for, for zones, or a database. Um, and, each of these plugins, uh, you know, if you have your own data source, you may decide that you want to be able to serve up data from that data source, say an internal 
uh, CMDB or something that manages your services. And what Yang is going to cover in a moment is how easy it is to actually extend uh, Core DNS to, to do that kind of um, uh, add, add, a, add a data source. The third kind of um, plugin that we have is what we would call sort of data manipulation plugin. So here you can, um, you can use policies to block particular queries. You can add metadata to a request, and then you can alter the request based upon the contents of that metadata. So uh, we have another talk tomorrow where what we'll look at is uh, in a Kubernetes cluster, you could actually configure the Kubernetes plugin to append client data information. So if a pod makes a query to your Core DNS server, uh, within your Core DNS plugin pipeline, you'll be able to see the, the namespace of that client pod, and then you can make a policy decision on that and say, hey, this, this client uh, uh, pod from this particular namespace is trying to access a service in a different namespace, and I'm, I'm going to disallow that. So that's the kind of functionality you can do with these plugins and with the kind of infrastructure uh, that's really would be extremely challenging to do in any other uh, DNS server. With that, um, do you want to jump in on the demo piece? Okay, so first of all, you know, like uh, John just mentioned that uh, if we are going to combine different sources of DNS information from different sources, like uh, from cloud windows, from let's say your local DNS uh, zones or from your local DNS servers, you can combine them into one and uh, that's the data consolidation process. And why you need that is because sometimes you may want to have, uh, let's go back, you may want to have a uh, so-called uh, single source of truth. Let's say you have a DNS server all the place because your IT infrastructure has DNS server, your cloud vendor has DNS server, you have some Kubernetes clusters on AWS, uh, you have some, let's say, uh, uh, database services on, let's say, on Azure or maybe on Google Cloud, and then you have your VPNs with some like a corporate uh, internal IT staff. All those things you can consolidate it into one. And in this case, uh, the coding is, is supposed to be just, uh, uh, what should I say, a front end of all the source of information. You can have one place to control the information. Uh, you make sure there's no collision. If there's a collision, coding as will sort out. Like uh, you, can, you can go through the order of different uh, information so you can decide which information will be exposed first. If the information is not available, you move to the next plugin and maybe you'll search for the next source, let's say uh, Google Cloud or AWS to find out. That's, that's one process of consolidation. But now here I'm going to share another example of say you have the same uh, DNS record and uh, you want to adjust your response based on the, the, the requester. So what does that mean is uh, it's a source IP based service discovery. Uh, let's just hypothetically say you maintain, a, let's say a, a DNS server and uh, this DNS server is located in your uh, company VPN, but of course your company may not just have a VPN, right? Your company may have some external information. Your company may, may also have some like a test workload. And uh, sometimes uh, when you're doing test, uh, when you're doing testing of your companies, let's say your company have a app de a development, you may want to manipulate in DNS to configure, configure additional stuff so that uh, let's say uh, a QA tester can potentially get a different DNS record based on which network it is in, right? So that's that's very common practice. But then you're going to ask the question: How do I return a different different response if uh, I only know the source IP of uh, the requester, right? So there's an easy way to do that. Of course, you're going to say: Is there any existing plugin available? in core DNS so that I can utilize the you know core file to manipulating different plugins and get the information. Uh, there's no such thing, uh, unfortunately, because uh, the 
there, there was some pretty, you know, pretty extensive discussion in the past about you should we set up certain, let's say, source IP based uh, service discovery plugins. And the conclusion was that uh, the source IP based uh, service discovery is fairly easy. However, to sort out a different, uh, uh, different use cases by different users is a hard process because we had to make sure if we're going to uh, write a plugin, we have to make sure it can fit in the all different scenarios. Unfortunately, all the scenarios look like to be totally different. Some people may have one request, some people have another request. Sometimes they say they want the source IP to be based on side block. Sometimes they say they want the source IP to be to be you know, like a single standalone source IP, or sometimes they say, okay, so they have some additional filtering rules to decide how they are going to do the source IP based uh, discovery. So eventually we say, okay, so may maybe we can, we will ask about the source IP based uh, discovery plugin for many years. Eventually we just say, okay, so maybe we can just write a simple plugin as a demo plugin to let people see how this can be done. And fortunately, this is uh, super easy. Uh, I'll just show with, uh, uh, let's say, uh, the total of, let's say, 80 lines of Go Golang code, and you can get the job done. And this is actually going to be a lot of fun experience, right? I mean, you can actually learn little Golang. You can build a plugin with core DNS, and you can get uh, get through all the necessary customizations as you need need, and uh, fit your scenario, right? So let's uh, let's just uh, give example of how exactly this demo plugin is going to work. So as as this, uh, as this slide shows, the demo plugin uh, is the source IP based service discovery. Uh, let's say you you are sysadmin or let's say IT admin, and you just decided to say, okay, so. Uh, I have a server. This server is going to be serving multiple purposes. This server has a DNS server. Uh, if if a request is within certain, uh, you know, like a side block or within the internal VPN or a segment of VPN, you want to return to one IP address, which potentially could be your, let's say, your testing server. And then you say, if uh, the requester is not from this specific uh, side block, you're going to say, okay, so let's just um, assume any, anyone else uh, requesting a DNS, uh, uh, DNS record will return by default one IP. And uh, if a uh, request is within a specific side block, it's going to return another IP. So th this diagram, as you can see, actually separates the network into two parts. The first part is the internal network. That's 172.0.0.0 slash 8. That's internal network. And then anything else will be outside. So let, let's just make this everything simple because we can certainly pick up any IPs to return. But just for fun, I pick up like a two IPs. One IP is 1.1.1.1. .1 Another IP is 8.8.8.8. .8 it's very unlikely you're going to use those two IPs. But 1.1.1.1 is Cloudflare's DNS server. And as we all know, 8.8.8.8 is uh, actually Google's uh, uh, DNS resolver, right? So let's just uh, set up this scenario and see how we can get the job done with uh, minimal lines of Golang code. Okay. So as we can see, if it's internal, we are going to return 1.1.1.1 IP, and if it's external, it's going to be 8.8.8.8. And uh, the request, we just make it straightforward, the request will always be example.org. You set up an example.org server, you return different IPs. That's fairly simple. Uh, so you're, you're going to write a, a plugin for Core DNS. And uh, the plugin, surprisingly, it's very simple. So how simple it is, it only requires three functions to fill in. And uh, two out of three functions are just a bare bone Stop function, you need to get the skeletons in place. And there's one function that you need. As you can see, the first function is the init function, which will perform a one time initialization because you need to register your plugin with Quoting as So Quoting as knows they will pass the, the information to your plugin, uh, allow your plugin to process the request. Setup is some um, plumbing in place so that it can pass the configuration from the file and capture it as a struct. Sorry, okay. Uh, the, the setup plugin uh, by itself is also straightforward. 
if you want to make uh, your plugin a little complicated because you have uh, different configurations, then you need to add more content. But in case all you need to do is just register a plugin, then that's fairly straightforward. And finally, the, the mid of the plugin is the serve DNS function. This function is uh, doing the processing of a DNS request and the return a response. Uh, and once the processing uh, has been done in this plugin, you just return and allow the next plugin to process. The next plugin can be a, a standalone plugin or another plugin you wrote. Right, but let's just uh, focus on one plugin uh, for this uh, demo plugin. That's going to be the source IP based service discovery. Okay, so as you can see, the init and setup function are fairly straightforward. For init function, you register a plugin because uh, uh, because the plugin is a DNS plugin, so you're going to register the server type as uh, DNS. Uh, by the way, you probably notice uh, there is a caddy in place. Uh, the reason caddy appears in in CoreDNS is because uh, uh, CoreDNS started by itself as a plugin of caddy. Uh, some I may some of you may know that caddy is a web server written in Go, right? So at the beginning, when CoreDNS was developed, uh, there was some design you know scenarios you had to figure out. So you need to get the plumbing in place. But you know, as we are, we are developers, sometimes we just think, what's the best way to write some system? You probably want to reuse someone else's code as much as possible in open source field, right? Because you don't want to waste time writing something from scratch. Uh, so that's how uh, CoreDNS gets started. CoreDNS started as a plugin of Caddy by itself. Of course, you're going to say Caddy is, uh, is uh, what should I say, uh, ATP server, right? But it's all similar, right? It's uh, either ATP or DNS. It's it's pretty much the same thing. You can utilize the plumbing to get the job done. So that's some of the creations to, uh, you know, like uh, to make your your code like reusable to reuse other, other people's code. That's a unique uh, function. Now the second one is a setup. The setup is essentially just a path configuration. Now for the service based uh, uh, source IP based service discovery. Uh, the the configuration we don't want to have any configuration because we just want to hard code everything. But in the future, if you want to make it a little fun, you can certainly write more stuff. But for now, let's just assume there's nothing. Everything is hard coded. Right. Okay. So that's the setup. Setup is to just uh, uh, get the configuration. And finally, that's the self DNS, which is the truly the meat of the plugin. You need to write in Go. So first of all, in, uh, the serve DNS will pass three parameters. The first one is going to be context. That's uh, pretty standard. The second one is a uh, uh, response writer. And the third one is just a uh, uh, request. So the first thing is you have to construct the, the request state to figure out what exactly is the information that has been passed to this plugin. Uh, as you can see, you can get the queue name, which uh, in our case, uh, in our example setup case, that's going to be example.org, right? And then you're going to say, I want to reply. What kind of IP address I'm going to reply? I'm going to reply either a.a.a.a, .8 or I'm going to reply 1.1.1.1. And uh, because I want, to, I want my plugin to be source IP based, I have to check the IP of the request. And the IP of request, I'll just make a very simple Golang function of uh, prefix search. If it's uh, if the uh, if IP start with 172 dot something, okay, that's going to that means it's an internal IP. I'm going to reply uh, 1 dot 1 dot 1 1. Otherwise, I'm going to reply 8 dot 8 dot 8 dot 8. That's uh, fairly straightforward, right? And then you have a. Uh, there's some like uh, uh, logging facility to say you you just print uh, the queue name, the IP and the reply, so that you can keep track of what they have done. And uh, finally, you just need to construct the answer. Uh, now you're going to say what else do you need? Well, that's pretty much all you need. You just return the the answer, and if you you know if if, if you cannot process, you just let the next plugin to to continue. So that's that's all you need. 
uh, then you'll say, okay, so if, if I build this plugin, so what else do I need to launch this plugin? Uh, in order to, for coding and to start, uh, you also need to initiate the plugin in the core file. The core file is the configuration uh, because our demo plugin uh, hard code everything. You saw the code, we use uh, IP addresses, specific IP addresses in the Golang code, so there's nothing to, to config. As I said, that's a setup function, there's nothing. So we just uh, invoke by, uh, by specify the demo is a plugin we want to invoke, and uh, that's it. Now, next thing is going to say how to build that. In order to build this plugin, you have to do several things. First of all, you have to play, uh, you, you can just download a, a core DNS source code, and uh, your Golang plugin should be placed under the plugin directory. Uh, in addition to that, there is a plugin.config, which uh, is needed in order to allow your Golang compiler to pick up this uh, code and build. Uh, and that's it. Uh, there are some easy way to to compile this plugin, you know, I managed to uh, draft a pretty lengthy dummy Docker build code. You can just get the job done. There are some flags to to pass. That's mostly just to get around some security uh, related, uh, you know, like uh, uh, restrictions. So you can you can just build. It. If you run this one command, one line command, it's several lines, but it's just just one uh, Docker command. You can build the uh, build your plugin as well as the uh, core DNS code and uh, you will see a binary that's the core DNS in your local directory and then you can just write run this local directory uh, you can just run this core DNS binary and that's it uh, just one more thing is uh, you see like I in the core file use a uh, 10.53 uh, of course you can uh, pick up a 53 but in case you are pick up faces three in certain Linux system, you may realize that you need a root address, right? If you're just doing some testing, you can start with 1053, which will avoid the collision. And that's it. Uh, okay, so you're gonna say where the source code. The source code is in a small repo. Uh, the repo is uh, part of the CoreDNS org, and if you just go to this repo, you're gonna realize the whole repo consists of virtually 80 lines. <laughs> and with 80 lines of Golang code, uh, you pretty much write the service, uh, uh, service discovery based on the source ID. And uh, why we showcase this plugin is because many people ask, okay, I want to achieve this thing. How, how to get the job done? Is there any core file we can use? And sometimes the answer has been, okay, it's a little, you know, if you just want to, grab the existing plugin and uh, tweak around some configurations to get job done. It, you know what, uh, it, it's gonna take some time to be a little creative to, to manipulating or even hack into the core file. And you're going to uh, you know, spend a lot of effort. Uh, and then if you say you want to learn Golang, you want to write some simple plugin, you can just uh, maybe spend, uh, spend you know, like uh, several hours uh, write like a hundred lines of code and get your job done, right? It's, uh, I think it's a fine process. Okay, so that's, uh, that's a demo plugin we showcase. Uh, as, as I said, you can go through this repo, you're gonna realize it's super simple, extremely simple. <laughs> that's something very important because we don't want to uh, solve a problem in complex way. We want to solve a complex problem in a simple way, not the other way around. So that's, uh, that's a demo plugin we showcased. Uh, and finally, we wanted to uh, go through several bullet points about uh, uh, coding as a community. Uh, if anyone is interested in contributing to coding as, you have several ways to contribute. Uh, you can start coding as in GitHub to uh, increase the visibility of coding as. You can also add uh, your institution's name to adopt the start uh, MD, uh, this will actually, uh, you know, like uh, allow you to have a chance to create a pull request. You know, you, you can just create a pull request and it should be easy. Uh, you can also uh, become a maintainer. In order to become a maintainer, you probably need to contribute a, a significant pull request. So what, what is the definition of significant pull request? Well, if you write a plugin, that's a, 
you know, that's a significant pull request. You also need to, to be sponsored by one existing maintainer, which is a very low threshold. And uh, then you become maintainer, which uh, sounds like a badge, a small badge to you. And you can just uh, let people know that you're also part of open source community and you're part of this uh, CNC project and you're a maintainer, right? So it's uh, interesting you can do. Uh, like I said, you know, the, like John mentioned, we have 28 maintainers. Uh, so the threshold to be a maintainer is extremely low. So just contribute something, uh, write some Golang code, spend maybe several hours, and you know, uh, have little fun. Okay, that's, uh, that's pretty much it from our side. Any, any questions? Thank you. All right, it looks like we have about five minutes for questions. So, gentlemen here. There's a microphone there uh, you can go stand at. That way uh, you'll, you'll show up on the recording properly and whatever. Um, yeah, thank you for the talk. Very uh, insightful. Um, also very interesting that GKE does not use cordiness. Um, thank you for this insight. Um, I was wondering whether you considered um, using a WebAssembly runtime um, as an extension to your current plugin system because on the one hand side, this would allow an author to create a plugin in basically any language, plus you would uh, avoid the recompilation step of Cordiness. You, you said Wasm, is that what you said? WebAssembly, Wasm. Yeah, Wasm, okay. Um, I, don't, I haven't explored that. I mean, it's definitely a possibility. Um, at one point, uh, one of our maintainers was looking at adding Lua support, but I, I think that that's a reasonable thing to do. We haven't, I have not looked at it, and you're welcome to to, uh, to, 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 to join in on GitHub and our Slack channel. We, we have a Slack channel on the CNCF Slack, not on the Kubernetes Slack. Um, and uh, we, we'd love to see something like that. Right now, you're right. It requires a recompile of, we don't have a, a dynamic plugin system. It's, it's a built-in, compiled-in plugin system. All right, I created a ticket. <laughs> <laughs> Any other It Looks like there's somebody here. Hi, hey, uh, thank you for the presentation. Um, small question about the testing. What do you suggest for the testing of the plugins? Are there any tools or techniques? Well, unit tests for sure. Um, just go unit test, standard go unit test. But um, we have some end-to-end -end tests that are part of our CI infrastructure. Um, and I'm not, I don't recall what we're using there specifically, but... Um, Years ago, I put together a container, a container image with some testing tools in it for DNS, but I don't have anything specific that I can recall off the top of my head. We, we do some performance tests. Um, if we go look at the tooling we have in our CI, that's probably where I would start and, and pick up the tools that we have there. And what if the plugin is um, not going to uh, land in the, how to say, in the main base uh, code base of core DNS. What if it is a homemade plugin and we would like just to run the tests uh, in our CI, apart from the unit tests, of course? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, whatever you use in your CI now, I mean, it's just a process. It's pretty, it's pretty straightforward. So as far as testing like query tools, I mean, it, it all depends. If you're doing right, you wanna do sort of end-to-end -end testing from a functional standpoint, then things like just your simple command line tools like dig or whatever are fine. But if you want to do um, load testing, um, sorry, it's been a couple years since I looked at the testing tools, since I was working on the testing tools in this. So I can't recall. We, we, there's a, a few that we used um, to like really. So one of the interesting things, and in, I don't know, I have two, one minute left. Um, like when you when you do start start to do some of the load testing on DNS, you, you know the you start to tend to be limited by things like the 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 packets per second that your cloud provider will even allow right on that on that particular level of node because they, the the packets per seconds tend to be pretty high on the DNS server. So, but there's a bunch of tools. Do, do you recall any of the names of the tools? I would have to look it up. Uh, I mean, frankly, I'm going to say. You know, if you're going to test uh, DNS, I mean, DIG certainly is the best tool available, frankly. On the other hand, if you're going to say you want to write something in Golang, 
you know, as, as we walk through the plugin, you probably realize the DNS by itself is fairly straightforward. You have the query, you, you're going to res response, uh, uh, you're going to return a response. I mean, you, you can find many ways to test, frankly. Looks like we have one more question. Maybe we can sneak it in quick. We're being yelled at now. Yeah, um, so my question is based on how core DNS might be used or be helpful for like blockchain networks where you need to find peers and stuff like that. But it's a bit different because in this case, it's like some peers might uh, behave in some way that you might not want to keep it up, uh, but, but not about behavior, just like about finding the peers and maybe uh, putting them down if it's not working anymore or something like that. And th this is the first question and the, the following one is like, if, if those peers uh, are not supposed to be kept in there, like in a file if they're not working anymore or if we can find them anymore, like is deploying core DNS on a stateless service a way to go or that will be like a no-go? I think I'm gonna need a little more context and we're out of time. Why don't you come over here? We can talk about it offline. Yeah, sure. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Okay, thanks.